Okay. Well, welcome everybody from different corners of the world. Uh, this is a blessing of the digital era that we can meet from Mogadishu to London to Sweden to Norway, Finland and Spain and Zoe in, where are you Zoe? In London maybe right now? Yeah. So anyway, my name is Britta Houston and I'm in charge of Women Federation in Sweden. And recently, together with uh, Vigdis Parkins here uh, from Norway, we have been appointed as, as the directors of the Northern region of Europe. So uh, Women Federation has started a monthly series of events that we call Her Story. Uh, each woman has a very unique story, a life story that needs to be told. And um, in this monthly series, we in invite uh, special women every month to share their story and to bring us into their culture uh, and challenges and successes. So today is my pleasure to introduce my dear friend Aisha Gestir Omar. She is today joining us from Mogadishu, Somalia. She is originally from Somalia. She's been traveling and living in both Sweden and in uh, Somalia for, for many years. Uh, I mean, unfortunately for me, I haven't seen her maybe for six years now because she decided to, to uh, move to Somalia to try to help out to help the, the government of the country, uh, yeah, to, to build it up. So um, um, you have been a bridge builder actually here in Sweden as well for the different authorities and, and the Somali community for many years. And you've been starting, she's been starting uh, several women organizations in Sweden as well as in Somalia. And Aisha is a strong activist for human rights and particularly women's rights and chil <coughs> children's rights. <coughs> so Aisha, with these words, I want to give you the floor and, and please tell us about you and your story. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, to welcome me the International Women Federation. I'm very glad to hear from different women. Uh, as you said, my name is Asha Omar Gestir, but in Sweden, sometimes we put it first, Gestir. <laughs> uh, I was being raised in Mogadishu. Uh, I, I had a family and my siblings were, you know, like my mother had 10 children, three girls and seven boys. Uh, my father was a businessman, but when he was little, he was an orphan. Uh, but he was uh, during the colonization in Somalia, you know, like Somalia, it was colonized by Italian and uh, French and English. So we are from Mogadishu where the Italian colonized and while my father was little, it was get, it, he get help from a Catholic uh, priests uh, as long he was an orphan. For me, I started school, I mean daycare when I was little then I studied uh, Arabic in school. After high school, I went to India to study part of my education. I studied psychology there. And I came from a family that, uh, you know, like my father, he, he, I can say that he was kind of feminist. <laughs> he, he supported uh, uh, the girls and or women as long we live in, in, in a patriarchal country. 
uh, he used to tell us to, 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 to be educated so we can um, have our own life uh, just in case if my husband dies or divorce me so I can, I can continue my life by myself, not marrying another man to raise my children. He taught me uh, uh, to be equal with my brothers because he always told my brothers to, to clean and cook. It's mm. good for them. So, that was a bit unusual, uh, wasn't it? Yes, it was unusual, mostly. Even my uncle, I had only one uncle who was a brother to my father. He wasn't like that, you know. Sometimes we used to wear jeans and he used to beat us outside and my father used to talk to him and tell him, this is my girls. They will live the way they want. That's what I want. Don't, don't uh, beat them or say anything to them. You know, I trust my girls. He used to say that. Mm. <laughs> my elder sister, the firstborn, she was older than me, almost 10 years, 12. Uh, she was a national basket player. And that time we didn't have a girls team. So she, she, her team was boys. She was very strong. She had short hair, kind of, she looked a beautiful uh, young man. <laughs> <laughs> she used to play basketball and she had uh, uh, a car and you know like my mother in the beginning she never used to read and write but after some time she went to uh, informal schools and she could you know write and drive her car and I was happy that we had a good family who told us you know, to respect others and to respect other religion. Though we have only one religion in Somalia, but uh, at the same time, we respected the other, like the our neighbors who were Catholic and my father was in, uh, you know, help by the whole, and my own sister, she was in a Catholic uh, school and college. After that, I came to, uh, one minute, please. Hmm. Hello. Some, some, sorry. What happened? Is it the connection? <laughs> Uh, anyway, after the be, before the civil war started in Somalia, I, I came to Sweden. To uh, it was in, in 1989. My first son was born in Smola. Then, while I was in uh, flicking for legning, uh, like the uh, refugee camps. I could speak English and Arabic. So when I was at the camp, I already started helping women who, who are there if they have problem in, uh, in, in the hospital. Or, so most of the Swedish people could speak English. So I, I, was, I started already helping them there. That time I was pregnant and I got my second son in Kalmar. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I moved to Lund and uh, I studied human rights there and uh, a bit psychology. I was uh, teaching children about Somali language, those who were born in, in, in Sweden and, and those who are newcomers. I was teaching them Swedish also. And I was working as a health communicator uh, as long as I studied psychology and I was helping the, the newcomers, you know, to know about their rights and their duties when it comes to health and so many other things and uh, about schools and all that. So after that, I started uh, having a 
women organizations because many, many Somalian who were there, majority were not educated. Many of them, they came from, you know, like nomads. And so women had a lot of culture conflict in Sweden and could not understand what's going on. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I moved to Yutobori again. I had my other son in Lund. Uh, I have two uh, only sons. I don't have girls, but I fight for the girls. You know, like I always work with the reproductive health, especially when it comes to female circumcision. Because when we came to Sweden, many of us had difficulties because when the Sweden when we go to the hospital and delivering children, many Swedish doctors were shocked because they have never seen circumcised women and they didn't know how to help to deliver their children. So there was a lot of misunderstanding in there also. So many women got uh, cesarean and uh, you know, the still culture conflict created more uh, misunderstanding because many women felt like they were not welcome and some of them they were afraid even to go to the doctors because the questions they get from the from the doctors you know like asking them how many children they have when will they stop and so many questions that they didn't like so sometimes some women even delivered at home and some who never had circumcision, you know, like some of them maybe didn't have circumcision and still they had a lot of questions. How come they are different from the other women? And so I was really helping women and, and the Swedish side also to, to, to create this bridge to understand each other. Mm. Yeah, then I started, uh, uh, thinking about Somalia too. So 2009, I came back to Sweden, uh, I mean, to Somalia, and I became advisor to the prime minister, former prime minister, Omar Abdi Rashid. I was uh, uh, gender and child protection advisor to the prime minister, and I was working hard to have a women their own place at the state house, because in that time, women didn't have even a separate toilet that they could go. So sometimes they have to go to the offices to look for uh, a toilet and and the protocol, you know, it was only for, for men. Mm. And some friends, uh, they just let the men go in and women had really difficult. So I created a door for them. I, I became a... Uh, uh, I took the protocol so I could help women. And then my office, I make a place for them to, to pray. And then I have uh, my own computer and printer and, and I had fruits and coffee. And because sometimes even the old people who come there waiting for the prime minister's office, some of them are diabetic and they don't have anything. So they may sit long time. So I was helping them to, to have something, you know, because of their diabetic and everybody liked it that, and they went to the prime minister and they were, they, they were telling him that the best thing they, he did was my office because how I was welcoming people and helping them to go in. Then I became the, chair lady of Somali National Women Organization. Uh, at that time, uh, I was helping still the women, their rights and, and, and to be in the government and uh, be in the position for decision making and all that. Then 2012, there was, uh, I was in the National Theater and there was this accident, uh, suicide bomber, who was a young girl 
exploded and I was wounded, then uh, they called the, the, the embassy, the Swedish embassy in, in Nairobi, as long as I was a Swedish citizen. Then I went to Nairobi and uh, the Swedish embassy in Nairobi helped me and I came back to Sweden. They stayed some years because I psychologically and physically, I wasn't so good that time. Then I came back 2016 and I still become the, the advisor to the governor of Banadir in Mogadishu, where I am now. And I'm still advisor to the governor about the child rights and child protection. Then I made and other organization helping women, uh, Diaspora Women's Health and Education Network, and, uh, and also Somali Professional Ocean Lifeguard. You know, in, in Somalia, we don't have lifeguard at the beach and we have the longest uh, beach in Africa. So like Fridays and, th and Thursdays, many people die. And uh, and I am still doing it because you know I liked a lot of things in Sweden. For example, mm -hmm. when it comes to lifeguards, and when it comes to uh, uh, swimming education in schools, because uh, Somalia ninety nine percent are Muslims, but it's still it says in the Quran and and Prophet Muhammad say that you have to teach your children to swim but nobody does here and in Sweden what I liked most was uh, the curriculum of education there is uh, that children have they learn while they are in school now I went to the ministry of education and uh, the curriculum that now they are doing is the physical education they are adding also swimming and uh, i'm working hard that at the beach we, we should have our own side and women could have a swimming burka and uh, the, the 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 curriculum that they should add so i'm still enjoying what good things i learned from sweden to, to have it in here in Somalia. And, uh, and we believe as Somali women, they are really strong women. And I think and we are peace lords, not warlords. So mm. it's women who can create uh, peace everywhere. That's what we think. Mm. And we are fighting to have that peace in Africa, inshallah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So if any questions, no. I'm asking, if, if I'm forgetting something, you, are, no. you can ask. No. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I remember when you came back after that accident because can, actually, yeah. can you hear me? Aisha, can you hear? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can't hear proper. Ah, Hello. I can. I can hear you. Okay, you cannot hear me, Aisha. Hmm. Okay. Can you hear me now, Aisha? Yes, yes, now I can hear. Oh, okay, yeah, the internet connection sometimes is not perfect between uh, Somalia and and uh, Sweden, everybody, so you know, or I mean, you know. No, Aisha, I just remember when you came back after that accident, you know, yes. because it was the opening of the theater that had been closed for many years in Mogadishu, wasn't yeah. it? And I, I remember... Think it was the 28 years that we had a, a, a TV that they were celebrating for that. So it was in the National Theater that they made the, 
uh, uh, the meeting. Yeah. Yes. yes. And then this explosion was right a few seats from where you were sitting. Yes, uh, the, the woman who exploded was sitting behind me, three rows, you know, like three lines behind. Yeah. So yeah. she exploded and many people died. And luckily that day, I was sitting next to my friend. So his friend came, there were two men, a sportsman. So I moved, I moved from my chair to the next one. And all the, the, the my friends who were sitting my right side died. Me also, I fainted because I was bleeding a lot. Uh, I broke my ribs and luckily, but nothing happened to my face or hands and so. But I remember you had, gra you had uh, pieces of granite you know of the bomb inside of your body they couldn't yes. they had to have several operations on you yes some they removed some are there still but i don't have any pain yet no no yeah no i i just want to mention it because it's it's a very dramatic life yes. actually yes. with this kind of constant uh, threat and terror from the al-shabaab and the terrorist groups. Yes. It's, it's very hard for us in Sweden to even imagine this. Yeah. So, so Aisha, I just want to ask you about your drive, your, your amazing drive that you've had. Mm -hmm. is, does it come from your father's love or where does it come I, from? I, I, think, I think it came from my family. It mm. came from my father, of course, and my mother also, who was always supporting my, my father. You know, like we are in a country that men are allowed to marry four wives, but mm. my father, he was okay, you know, like when it comes to financially, and many people are used to tell him, why can't he marry another wife so he can have other children, you know? So, but he was totally different. He used to say that whatever I have is because of my wife. Mm. Uh, she supported me. Why should I marry another? And I have children, so I don't want to have more children. And, you know, he treated us equally, you know. Mm. Now when it comes to boys and girls. And I can't say it's bad, you know, when you are grown, grown up with it, that when we come from the school, you know, like some girls that they have to help their brothers, they cook, then they come from the school and they cook and they give and they, they wash their clothes and all that. But my father was not like that. He used to tell the boys also that they should take their part, you know, they have to clean, they have to cook, uh, so they can learn themselves too. So, and my mother was really uh, supportive. She had, a, you know, like, she, in the beginning, she couldn't even write and read, but after she used to learn. And I was going to, to Arabic school, you know, like home, we speak Somali, but I learn Arabic. So she didn't know how to read, but maybe she's in the kitchen and she tell us, you know, if you have uh, homework, I want to listen. Arabic, you know, like when we have lectures and, you know, so both of them helping each other. And I see a family who love each other and are together, not divorced, not married to another wife. It makes me unique and different. Mm. And uh, he encouraged, my father also talk, used to talk to us. I remember when I was 16, you know, like when you are a teenager, he called me one day and he said, you know, Asha, you are 16 now. Yes. 
So he said, you are responsible now, you know? I said, yes. Then he said, you know, you are very beautiful. <laughs> Boys will come after you. <laughs> so he, was, he told me, but I will tell you one thing, the boy who really loves you will come home. So you should welcome him home, never go with him to his house. So I asked him, why can't I go? He said, you never know. If he doesn't want you, he may rape you, you know? I used to be afraid so to go out because of his, uh, but I was, I had the confidence. So if I talk to anybody, I used to welcome and, and you know, he taught us how to cycle and as a family, we used to play football together. So I, I, I got this childhood, you know, playing and, 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 and the confidence that the parents talked to me. And the, the, like my sister was my role model also, who is el older than me because she was well known and she was playing basketball uh, for the national team. They used to go out of the country with the, with the Somali airline, you know, like all sports groups. And so I was, I came from uh, a family who were together, sports and, 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 and modern and, you know, and religious and everything together mm. kind of <laughs> so that that shaped me in a good way mm. that's what i think <laughs> and the experience of that for me to be in india and see another culture and the way they live and uh, you know that make me yeah i think strong women strong mm. women Yes. So, so what, what, how do you see the future for Somalia now? How do you see it? You, you yeah. said you, yeah. I mean, you said you said something about the women being the peace lords. You said something like that. Yes, yes. I think. I think women took uh, uh, a very good role when it comes to, to the peace in Somalia and when it comes to you know, rebuilding the country, because even if they're outside, uh, mostly it was women who was supporting their families and everything who is behind with uh, those strong men. So I think Somalia is getting much, much better. It's not like before, every time it's changing, you know, like women took the role of, uh, you know, like long time they had, uh, what they call, uh, you know, like there was fight between tribes. So they, they make green lines, you know, this side, this tribe, uh, there, the other tribe, the other side. So women, they believe that they don't have tribe because if the woman marries, for example, if I marry a Swedish man, my children were called Swedish, not Somali. So if they marry another tribe from, some, I, from for example, me and my children are from different tribes. It's because the, the man always take the name of the children. So women, they are the one who opened these green lines between tribes because they took, they took uh, you know, like green leaves and they took their children and, you know, women and youth went to the other side and they said, no, my children are on, on the other side, as some other women tell children are the other side. So it's them, it's them who created that peace. And in my culture, a long time, if there is a problem from two, two tribes, they used to intermarry, you know, they take from this so that the fight should not come back, kind of. So hmm. women, women are 
re really blame a good role. And, and, you know, like last time, not this president, but the other president, uh, one former president was here, uh, women came to the parliament 24%. And they How many? 24%. Uh -huh. There were women at the parliament. But now they went back again because of the tribal leaders, you know. Uh, last time when they came in 24%, and uh, we were talking to the tribal leaders that we are their daughters, that we have to take part of this and that, you know. That's how they came to the parliament. But the, the but this time you know they they played another role and now we have federal government so we couldn't come in like last time but still women are really trying their best and those women who get the chance to be uh, a minister or somewhere that they 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 took that role honestly and transparently so. Mm. But, but still, it's uh, it's it's, uh, it's, it's a man's challenge. world. <laughs> man's yes, world. in Somalia, it's man's world. <laughs> mm. But because it's changing, and and women also are learning because sometimes the 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 mistakes are ourselves also, because some sometimes women don't know their uh, power and they don't help each other. And that's another challenge that we have. If we should have supported each other morally and, and you know, physically or economically, uh, we would have been in a good role. But still, women are learning. You know, we are not in politics, but we like women like uh, social affairs, not political. But now they are learning. Uh, mm. step by step it's it's not like before mm. now, uh, now i'm trying to make a political party and and become a president in the future you never know <laughs> <laughs> i need and i need your support <laughs> the international women federation <laughs> yeah Aisha. you know uh, yeah i'm mm. so happy that um that I can see you here when I cannot give you a hug for in a real life, but maybe I can do that too sometime. Yes, uh, yes. I will come back, inshallah. Yes. Um, so I, I think maybe, uh, Aisha, we can open up for questions from the audience here. So the, so, mic, the mic is open, so anyone can ask a question. Yeah. Let's see if we have any questions coming in. Yeah, yeah Marcia? Yes, uh, thank you. It's not really a question. I would like to thank you for sharing your personal testimony. And uh, I'm really glad to see how you uh, were able to, to come to a position where you can help your society. And uh, of course, uh, you have learned different things. And also you can try and do differently than what we are doing elsewhere. We, we still need to learn in, uh, in the Western world uh, to become uh, motherly and caring and uh, really doing that at a very wide, uh, in a very wide way, like really becoming that way to the whole society. And so you have this chance now that you are trying to enter politics, you can uh, have that role and uh, take care of uh, Somalia um, that needs so much, right? It needs so much. In a sense, it's, uh, it's, lucky that you have that chance to do so many things for Somalia. So thank you again and congratulations for your beautiful testimony. Thank you very much. You know, many things I learned from the West. Sometimes I used to say, 
uh, when I came to Sweden, and in Sweden, I felt like I am in a country that where the system is Islamic. That's how I used to feel because whatever I used to hear about Islam, practically it was in, in Sweden, but the people were not, not believing Islam. So I learned a lot from there, I guess, which passes me which my father raised me how to be like, you know, transparent and caring and all that I see in the system of Sweden, not the system in Somalia. We say we are Muslims, but the system lies in Sweden, I guess. <laughs> so I thank God that I was in the West, especially in Sweden, mm. because I grow in proper way. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anne? <laughs> yes. Um, thank you very much, Asha, for your, um, excuse me, for your, um, your story, your testimony. I have a question, maybe a little bit more personal. You were going back and forth from Somalia. First, I would like to know how many children do you have and what happened to the children when you were going back and forth? And are there are some of your children in Sweden and are some of them in Somalia? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have uh, <coughs> three sons. I have three sons. They are grown now. They are in Sweden. Uh, my first son is married and he has a uh, I have two grandsons also. <laughs> so mostly when I'm going uh, uh, and to Somalia and coming back, they were in Sweden. And they, they are still in Sweden, but I brought them to Somalia. They have seen it in different places. Actually, my children are from Buntiland. Now we have federal government and different states. So my children are from Buntiland. I am from Mogadishu. And they came to Mogadishu, they were in Buntilan, and they liked it very much because I used to take them the good side and good places like uh, to swim and uh, to eat fresh food and they really like and we talk every day. So now as, as, as long that, that they can take care of themselves, they are in Sweden and I am in Somalia, but Three months back, two months back, I was in Sweden. I always visit. Yeah. Yes. Unfor unfortunately for, for, for me, the sons, they don't live in Malmö anymore. So that's why I haven't seen Aisha when she's been back. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, they are, they are in, in Göteborg. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. I have a question. Um, yeah, I just wanted to know about this, uh, you're talking about circumcision, about women and how you're kind of trying to tackle this uh, practice um, and how, how can it be kind of stopped or why is it still continuing? Uh, is there many obstacles for you to uh, deal with these issues? Uh, actually, I think culture always, you know, culture is bigger than religion. Sometimes I say that. Uh, circumcision, it's in uh, Somalia and uh, many of them, they think as long boys, men are circumcised, women also is compulsory that as long we are Muslim, that's how they think. And I think it's because of that it was conti in continue in, in Somalia. And while I was in Somalia, I never think about circumcision because it was normal, everybody had it. Although in my family, it was totally different. We were not infibulated, but we had symbolic kind of symbolic circumcision that they don't touch anything 
like some Arab countries have. But in Somalia, myself, when I was very young, mostly I thought I was not circumcised because I was not infibulated and I didn't have a lot of problem. And when I was circumcised, I was only six days in the hospital. And when I was, you know, like teenager, I, I used to play with boys because if I play with girls and they find out that I'm not infibulated, they may pull me, you know, like we had songs that to push down the girls who were not circumcised. So I always used to play football with the boys just to run away from the girls. <laughs> but many, many girls are not doing like that. But when I came to Sweden and people asking me why I was not circumcised and, you know, they felt like they could feel the doctors when I had my first child, uh, second child in, 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 in Sweden, they could feel that it was different. So I came to study myself. I never used to look at. When I looked at, I was happy. You know, in the beginning, I was angry with my parents. Why couldn't they infibrillate me? I was thinking that way. But when I saw the how it is and how difficult women have, and I was thanking God, and I said, my parents were the best <laughs> because I was not like that. And I started learning more and being against, you know, like uh, 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 circumcision and, and many women who were in Sweden, the Somalian women, they come to know that it's nothing to do with religion. When they met other Muslim women who know nothing about circumcision. So they started not circumcising their, their children, but we had a lot of difficulties in Sweden because if we have another sickness also, some doctors always think about circumcision, you know? So there was a lot of problems when it comes to circumcision in Sweden and we were more discriminated than the other people, uh, you know? And, and I'm sure there was many other women who, who work with organization was making it more extremely just to get something to work. So we started as a group fighting back and trying to stop female circumcision and uh, and still I'm doing it, doing research and how it changed. And even in Somalia, it's not like that. People started talking about it. it it's nothing to do with religion. And, you know, this advocacy changed a lot of people's mind, but we can't say it's zero tolerance. It's, it's zero, it's not yet zero. It's still there. And it's still, some people are infibulating also but there are not many like before. People are learning now. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Any, yes. Any more questions? Yeah. Mm. Hello. Yeah, I'm just seeing, looking to see if anybody has some other question. <clears throat> I, I I just remember uh, referring back to Anne's question a little bit about the, the children. I remember when when you Aisha when you decided to go back to help your country uh, to to develop, you know, and how you were asked actually by uh, the government to come back. Uh... Wasn't Sorry, it? can you repeat it? I couldn't hear. Okay, no, no. I, I remember the time, the, the, you know, the struggle, you know, I don't know if it was seven years ago, whatever, when you had to decide 
if you were going to go back because the government wanted you to come back to Somalia and and your boys were here i remember that and then you 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 they asked you to be some advisory for women and and children isn't that right yes yes yes, yes. Uh, actually it was uh, 2016 yeah Could have yes, been. I came back and I, I'm still here and working with the women's rights and and um, and uh, child protection also. You know, there is a lot of uh, orphans and, you know, like the schools also, you know, we have to rebuild it again. And I'm, I'm, I'm really doing that, you know, uh, mm. yes. Um, there was an election last year, wasn't the election was last year? There was yes. Uh -huh. Yes, it was. It was fifteenth uh, May. We elected a new president, hmm. Hassan Sheikh. Now he's uh, he was a teacher also. You know, he's uh, well educated and and uh, professor. He's a uh, <clears throat> now he's trying to, you know, to do something to develop the education. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so and and I'm I'm trying to take that chance to, uh, you know, like uh, we have problems with the uh, disabled uh, children and. Uh, you know, those who need special needs, you know, many, many in Somalia, they think about those who have uh, problems with their legs or hand or, you know, deaf and, and uh, blind only, but there is many children who are dyslexia, many children who are autism. So we need to, to, to have, education for them also, uh, the children with special needs also in, uh, when it comes to education or all that. And we are working with that. With the, now we have a, a, in the government, now they accepted a, a diaspora. You know, many Somalians came back from, from, from diaspora, from different countries. So now we have we have uh, an office in the Ministry of uh, External Affairs, and now when it comes to education, also many came with their children back. You know, so we have to take care of them. Uh, mm. So we have Scandinavian somebody is responsible for us there, and we have the Swedish embassy also, and. Uh, Two weeks back, we met the the, the ambassador, yeah. uh, Swedish ambassador. We were there, and we have uh, now we have uh, I think around forty uh, Swedish Somalis who is in Somalia. Some of them are in the government. Some are ministers. Some are MBs. Mm -hmm. So we have to take care of, uh, like, for example, uh, Somali, Swedish who came back to Sweden when it comes to, you know, to renew the passport or maybe those who have problems in here and, and children who came back also or maybe came with their parents. And uh, the, the next time, uh, uh, June 1st is the independent day, isn't it? We are planning to have in the embassy the first time to celebrate Swedish. Oh, the 6th six, six of June. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> We are planning. So I was thinking to have this uh, national uh, uh, Swedish dress, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm making it kind of Somali Swedish look. <laughs> hey. Yeah. Wow. You have to send me a picture. <laughs> <laughs> I will. <laughs> uh, 
So, so okay. we are. Oh, sorry. Did you have so a question? In, sorry. In, in Somalia, we have this tribal thing, you know? So from now on, my tribe will be Somali Swedish. <laughs> you have a question, Anne? Anne? We Sorry? can't hear you, Anne. You have to unmute. Asha, you uh, were talking about orphans in Somalia. Is there a, it's an Austrian organization. Does the SOS Kinderdorf, these are, uh, this is an Austrian organization worldwide who takes care of children. Do you have this in Somalia? No. You have um, do you know about SOS Kinderdorf? This is the SOS, they was founded by a man by the name of, I think, Gamina. Yeah, Maya? I think it was, yeah. They was founded by this man after the war because there were so many orphans. Yes. And he set up the, these orphanages or these come the, there with families in Austria and now it's all over the world. Yeah. Uh, uh, SOS born Bia, Aisha. SOS yeah. born Bia. I think we have uh, a place called SOS. Yeah, I that's think, it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Ah, but, oh, yeah. but it was really. <laughs> No, like the the after the civil war, during even the civil war, it wasn't working well because of the problems we had, you know. So the, the, there is a lot of orphans and street children, and I think it would have been good if we had, uh, uh, you know, some some people are taking care of some of them, but the government is still is not strong to take care of uh, orphans. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And, and now, you know, like when we had the civil war and all that, there was a lot of young, young girls who were raped or maybe given birth and some of them are just leaving the children outside on the streets. Mm. So those needs to be helped also mm. to like those girls who who lost their parents and you know some some of them they don't have a, a proper place you know like uh, to be ca taken care of uh, it's it's not so many some people take care of that. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, because there is still also the threat of the of the different terrorist group, and it's not only Al Shabab, is it? It's a lot of different types. Uh, I mean, the strongest, the strongest was Al Shabab, but the others maybe it was starting now, but it was being stopped. Mm. Uh, Al Qaeda, or but the, but but the main problems that we have is Al Shabab. Mm. Right. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yeah, Sweden and Somalia actually has a, a relation since a long time ago, even before the 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 civil war and all the problems that started in nine in the early nineties. And I know that, uh, like you said, some of the politicians have lived in Sweden. And also, I know the the biggest uh, children books uh, company. I mean, or the or the writers of the children book come from Sweden. I heard uh, Somali books. Yes, with the Somali children children's books. Yes, so, yes, because uh, uh, you know, like in Sweden, there is many Somalians who are in Sweden when it comes to other countries. Uh, apart uh, England and, and United States, but uh, in the Scandinavian, uh, Sweden is the majority who are there. Yeah. And uh, many of them are very active and yes, trying to do something with the organizations and yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, in, any, 
Yeah, the question here. Uh, it was it was so nice to see you here, Aisha. Thank you so much nice. for sharing about your life. And um, you know, yeah, it, this is the blessing of, of of being able to connect to you like this. Mm. And uh, I hope to be able to do things together with you uh, in the future. I mean, whenever I've seen Aisha, we have been to different um, celebration of Women's Day and visiting different places. And she, Aisha is, a, is like a magnet. Oh, uh, everything will always be centered on Aisha. Mm. <laughs> did, did, did I tell you, you know, like in, uh, in uh, October, I was in uh, Greek. Uh, I came for a competition for in the Greek. life camp. Uh -huh. I, I was swimming uh, 50 meters uh -huh. and I won. I got gold medal. <laughs> you know why? <laughs> because I was the only black African a woman who is especially a Muslim with the, this burqa. <laughs> <laughs> I was competing for myself only. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> But it was fun. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. And it was lovely to hear about your upbringing and about your father. Yeah, uh, Pe you. Did you want to say something, Pavy? Pavy oh, had it. Yeah, I, I think so, because I'm from Finland and I really appreciate, Asha, what you said. <laughs> and I'm inspired that the, how much you are saying that you said you want to be the president. So I really encourage you. And I hope that we Scandinavians can support you 100%, not just from Sweden, from Finland as well, and all the Nordic <laughs> countries. And uh, I always say, welcome to Finland too. I'm a daycare teacher and also we, I have a very multicultural group. And I appreciate also Somali people who come there. And one of my children went back to uh, Somalia just recently. So we need somebody like you who will actually go step by step for education mm. and supporting women and families. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Pavi. Yeah. yeah, it's true. It's really true. Yeah, we but, should support each other. So yes. if, yeah. if women support each other, we can go ahead, you know? We mm. can make the peace in this world if we are together. Mm. So, yeah. So we should be everywhere in decision-making places because we are not there. Sometimes you, you see only men sitting and deciding something, you know? Mm -hmm. So in the future, yeah. <laughs> we should be somewhere, mm. if not president, but somewhere else that we can decide something. Yeah. to bring the yeah. peace in the world. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Aisha. And thank, thank you, everybody, joining us thank today. And I think we will end with these words. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. For you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Shall we quickly take a photo together? Oh, yeah. yes. I yes, yes, yes. Oh, Aisha, where are you? Oh, did you already? Did anybody take a picture? No. Oh, no. Aisha? I took a picture earlier on. Okay. You did? Yeah. Did that? Okay, great. You always do that. You always save us with this. Was I on the picture? <laughs> I came in five, I, 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 I came in a little picture. late. <laughs> I came in a little late. I don't know. Anyway, it's okay. We will add you in. Yeah, doesn't matter. So what shall I do with this picture? <laughs> Look at it. 